let me let me tell you what it's like to be a kid in the Orberg family. I got I have two girls and a boy, 28, 27, and 25, from my daughters this afternoon, from my middle daughter, Mallory, who's gonna be 28 next year, and keeps talking about this as her last year to be a Marine. And I'm like, Mallory, you would be a terrible Marine. She's like, I would be a great Marine. I said, Mallory, you're a wuss. You would be a terrible Marine. So she just emailed me this afternoon and said, Laura, her older sister, signed me up to get promotional recruitment offers from the Marines as a prank today. In turn, I have signed her up for an Ayn Rand libertarian-themed dating blog as Laura Taggart, a tea partier who smokes cigars and is looking for men over 40. Let the games begin. That's what it's like. I can't keep up. Well, I, I'm delighted to be here. I am a Biola alum and a Talbot alum. Um, when I first came to Biola in the fall of 1973, I had to talk to the dean before I was allowed to be admitted because Biola had a rule back then that you couldn't attend movies. And my job was I worked in a movie theater. So that sort of started my career off on the wrong note here. When I got to Talbot, um, there were three other women that graduated with me and the question I got asked the most was, why are you here? And I would say, same reason you are. So that was kind of my background. I had some great professors here at Talbot, Rex Johnson and Dennis Dirks, and knew pretty quickly after I graduated from the nursing program at Biola that I wanted to also possibly do church work. So I put myself through Talbot, working full-time as a nurse, and then have spent the last 20 years in pastoral roles and also in business consulting roles. So I wanna to talk to you tonight about what does it mean to be a great leader, and why Christian leaders ought to be on the forefront of cultural renewal. Because as Dallas Willard would say, our work is our primary place of discipleship. That by the nature of work, not because we value it more than our families, but because of the nature of work, we often end up spending a disproportionate amount of time in our work, and churches often don't see it as a serious place of discipleship. This is the best definition I've ever heard of leadership. Leadership is a way to, is, uh, leaders create a way for people to contribute in order to make something extraordinary happen. And when you think about the life of Jesus, that's exactly what he did. Leaders create a way to invite other people to the table, calling the best out of them for the purpose of making something extraordinary happen. And Christians have been for centuries and ought to be on the forefront of all kinds of innovation and creativity that's redeeming the world. There's a quote from Dallas Willard that I carry on my phone because it's too long to remember, but it's one of the best visions that I can think about when you think about what God had in mind when he created work before the fall happened. This is what Dallas Willard says. Faith is a vision that our destiny is to be absorbed in a tremendously creative team effort with unimaginably splendid leadership on an inconceivably vast plane of activity with an ever comprehensive cycle of productivity and enjoyment and this is what eye has not seen or ear heard that was before us in the prophetic vision. It's this great vision for what it means to be workers in the world as Christ followers. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit tonight about a great leader that I worked for. And then I'm gonna pull three threads out of what I learned from working with him that have carried me for, forward into my leadership career. A number of years ago, when I graduated from Biola, I went to work at St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange. And the first two years, I worked as a med surge nurse. And then the third year, I transferred down into the emergency room, because that's where the action was. And I loved working down there. I do remember driving to work every day, praying, God, don't let me kill anybody today. Tomorrow's fine, but not today, and I'm gonna pray the same prayer tomorrow. And we had one doctor who was a Christ follower, but he didn't talk a lot about it, who was the best doctor to work with. And when you got on for your shift that evening and you saw his name up on the board, you knew you were gonna have a great night. Why? Not only was he a great doctor, he was smart. He kept up on his reading. He knew what he was doing as a diagnostician and a treatment expert. But he also was able to create a team out of a disparate group of people. Because in the emergency room, you have a group of nurses that work with the doctors, but when you have a code with somebody, you call in people from laboratory and x-ray and respiratory therapy, 
most of whom don't even know each other. We're looking at each other's name tags, and it's pretty difficult in a crisis moment like that to make a team effort to save a person. He was remarkable at it. When we were in the middle of working on somebody, if it was appropriate and there was time, possibly we were waiting for lab results to come back, he was always teaching. He would ask us, okay, Nancy, if the lab results come back like this, what drug would you push next? He would ask somebody about the chest tube placement. He was always bringing us in and stretching us far beyond what our roles were. We felt like a part of the team, and he did it with everybody. I remember one evening I came in to work, and probably around 8 o'clock at night, we got a 24-year-old girl in in the middle of a code. And I remember her because when you have somebody that young, you work pretty relentlessly to make sure that you can save them. And it took us about three and a half hours before we knew we were going to send her to the intensive care unit and not the morgue. And he was teaching the whole time when it was appropriate. He was making decisions. He was asking us questions. We rallied at one point when we were waiting for results back from the blood test. He just said, listen, we're saving this girl. Absolutely, that's what we're doing. When we got done, some of the nurses transferred the girl upstairs to the ICU. Housekeeping came in and cleaned. I stayed back to chart and to do what nurses do best, to eavesdrop on what the doctor was talking to the intern about. He was coaching this intern that he worked with, and he was going step by step through every decision he made. When I pushed the bicarb, why did I do it then? When we got those blood results back, why did I make that change? And then, at the very end of the 20-minute debrief, he said to that intern, do you remember Carlos, who came in from housekeeping to clean this room up? And you could tell by the look on the doctor's face that not only did he not remember who the guy was from housekeeping, he was a little confused as to why he was being asked that question. And so he shook his head. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm so glad I'm not you right now, because I know what's coming. And he said, well, his name's Carlos. Blank stare. He said, I don't know if you noticed, but Carlos cleans these rooms up that look like a tornado went off in them faster than anybody else on the housekeeping team. And he sets them up so that when we get another patient in, we can take care of them immediately because everything's where it belongs. The guy's still not tracking with him. And then he just starts digging in. He said, Carlos has a wife. Her name is Maria. They moved here from Mexico three years ago. They have four children. And he named each of the children and their ages. And then he said, they live in an apartment about two miles from here in Santa Ana. And I'm thinking, of course, I'm writing the whole time, acting like I'm writing. He's been to their house. And then, in what I think is probably one of the most amazing moments of leadership I've ever seen, he squeezed that intern on his shoulder and he said, hey, when we work together next Tuesday, here's your assignment. You come in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon ready to tell me something about Carlos that I don't already know. <laughs> yes. It wasn't about medicine. It wasn't about brushing up on a skill. It was about if you're going to be a doctor and you're going to lead a team of people, you better know and value everybody on the team. And I don't want to see you valuing one person over another because of what they get paid or what their education is about. I've never forgotten that moment because I think I took so many of those threads from what I experienced in that emergency room that night. And I want to talk about those three things. And then I'm going to give us a few minutes to ask questions and maybe interact a little bit. The first one was, Actually, let me, let me back up for just a second. Um, one of the passages in scripture, and Barry, thanks for giving me a Bible that I need a magnifying glass to read. Look at this. Look at this. Who reads this? Um, one of the passages, of course, I didn't bring my own, so I suppose it's my own fault. One of the passages that corresponds to what I experienced that night is in Exodus chapter 35. Love this passage. It's in the, the children of Israel are wandering in the desert. They're coming to the realization that they're not going to the promised land as fast as they thought they would. God has given them um, the wherewithal, the means coming out of Egypt, all the things that they were able to bring with them to put together the tabernacle. And God is giving directions about all these really amazing things that they can build for the tabernacle. And he's mentioning opulent things that are gold and silver and bronze, scarlet yarn, fine linen, the hides of sea cows, what church would want to be without one of those? Acacia wood, olive oil. It goes on and on with all these beautiful things. And then right in the middle of it, in verse 18, the tent pegs for the tabernacle, for the courtyard, and their ropes. Now imagine if your job in the children of Israel was to bring something that was opulent and beautiful, and the guy with the bag with the tent pegs and the ropes didn't show up. 
tabernacle's not going up. And that night in that emergency room, Exodus 35 was on display for me to see. That as much as the beautiful pieces of the church and the tabernacle were valued by God, so was the guy that drug the bag that held the tent pegs and the ropes. And if anybody in the world ought to be noticing people, it's Christian leaders. One of the things that this emergency room doctor taught me without ever saying it was the value of being a lifelong learner. Um, to be a Christ follower, we ought to be inspired in our curiosity. God has made this incredible world and we don't as much create things as we discover things. And when we discover things, we understand a little bit more about the nature of God. So Christian leaders ought to be the people that are leaning forward and inviting their teams to inspire their curiosity and be lifelong learners to discover new things. There was a study that was done 10 years ago with McKinsey consultants and a university up in Canada that studied 100 organizations and found that two thirds of all change initiatives in any kind of an organization fail. Now why they had to spend money on that, I don't know because I think everybody in the room here could have told them that. But the problem with change initiatives failing in organizations, and when you do that enough, you start to, re to create cynicism in your organizations and sabotage, where people just kind of give up. Of the one-third of the change initiatives that took root, do you know what the number one difference was? It was these organizations had a huge commitment to be an ongoing, lifelong learning culture. What does that mean? They, they did some more study. It means a couple of really simple things that you have systems in place that cause, that cause you to have reflective learning, that you ask lots of questions, and that you solve system problems and not surface problems, and that nothing in the organization goes untalked about. There are no elephants wandering around in the organization, that everything gets talked about. Those are all very biblical principles. For Christian leaders to lean forward and to be life long learners to inspire curiosity. We had a couple of teams at our church a couple of years ago, and we have a number of different campuses. So we put together teams of five people, three teams from different campuses collaboratively, and we sent one team out to Whole Foods, one team out to the Apple Store, and one team out to a local cafe that's kind of the heartbeat of our city. And I gave him an assignment to spend two hours there. The first hour, I just want you to make leadership observations. I want you to walk around. You can talk to the customers, to the people that work there. I want you to just look and see you're not in a church, you're not in a school, but leadership is going on all around you. Take notes. And then I want you to spend an hour unpacking those notes and telling us how would we use what we learned in these places in our churches. So one of the most fascinating experiments we did in our church, two years later, our people are still talking about what they learned there. It was just one small step in them realizing that there's great leadership everywhere. And they got to open their eyes and take a look around and see it and understand that that comes from God. Great leaders in a learning culture stretch themselves. They innovate. They become very self-aware of who they are and who they aren't. And that leaves them really comfortable in their own skin. Their ego gets in the right place. They're able to live in the middle of passion and humility, which is a great place to live. They're not threatened when somebody's better than them. In fact, great leaders who are committed to learning get thrilled to death when somebody gets on their team who's better than they are. And they applaud them and they resource them and they get obstacles out of their way. What does it mean to be a lifelong learner? To understand, as Dallas Willard said, that eternity has already begun and that our deepening our awareness and our learning of everything that God has created is one of the fundamental things of what it means to be a great leader. Last thing I want to say about being a learning culture, this doesn't stop until the day that you die. I turned 50 some years ago. I won't go into the exact date on that one. But ever since I did, Psalm 92 has been a passage that I've just spent a lot of time in. It talks about getting older with God. It says that the old will stay fresh and green, that they will continue to bear fruit. What would it be like in our churches? You know, people don't just automatically grow old well with God. People grow old, but not everybody grows old well. Not everybody grows old well with God. 
And what if our Christian leaders took that as a challenge to say, until the day I die, I will be a learner. Well, here's what that means. That means saying, I'm sorry. That means saying I was wrong. That means saying, I don't have the answer. What do you think? It means admitting that you don't have all the answers and that's sometimes counterintuitive to a leader, but it shouldn't be. My mom, who is actually here tonight, uh, is going to be 83 this summer and she'll kill me for saying that part. But she just told me two years ago that she's gonna stop going to Malawi, Africa with her church, which she's been doing for the last five years. And I said, why are you gonna stop going? You loved it. I thought she was over there holding babies at the orphanage. She said, well, the concrete wheelbarrows that I'm pushed, the concrete in the wheelbarrows is getting too hard for my arthritic fingers. I'm like, what are you doing over there? <laughs> oh, to, to just say till the day I die, I will not be irrelevant I will not be the obstacle on a team. I will not stay too long when I shouldn't stay and I should go. And I will go somewhere else and contribute, but I will be a lifelong learner. The second one, the thing that I learned from this doctor, which is really counterintuitive as a Christian, is one of the most necessary things for great leadership, one of the absolute most necessary things that we need to learn to use better is conflict. I was speaking to a woman a couple of years ago at our church, and we were talking about an older man in our church that we both adore. And I said to her, Kathy, I know why I love him. Why do you love him? And she said, well, I love him because he reminds me of Jesus. I said, huh, I love him, but he, he doesn't remind me of Jesus. Why does he remind you of Jesus? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, because he's so sweet and nice all the time. I said, you talking about the same Jesus I'm talking about? I said, Kathy, get a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And every time Jesus says something sweet, like you're beautiful, don't ever change, let's do lunch, put a little tick on the left-hand side of the page. And then every time he says something that you would wash your child's mouth out with soap for saying, like, you're not worthy of the crumbs I brush off the table to feed my dogs. Okay, that's at least a timeout. That's at least a timeout. Put a little tick on the right-hand side of the page. Jesus was a master of knowing when a kind word was necessary and not superficial and not manipulative. And he knew when to use conflict and he used conflict all the time to grow people. And I have no idea how in our churches we have gotten so far away from that. Now some churches do it too much. They're just mean, they're just mean spirited, they're rude, um, they're full of themselves, don't do that. But to really love somebody enough to say the hard things. Because here's the truth about conflict. Les and Leslie Parrott, you guys familiar with them? They do a lot of work on Christian marriages. And anytime you talk about a marriage, you're actually talking about a corporation because you, it's just about relationships. You can apply it. I love this sentence. Conflict is the only way to intimacy. I remember the first time I read that, I was like, what? If I wasn't so old, I would have that tattooed somewhere on my body, but now I'm afraid I have to lift my skin up to read it, and it's like, I'm not going there. <laughs> not gonna happen, not gonna happen. Conflict is the only way to intimacy. Oh my gosh, is that provocative or what? So this intimacy that we all desire, these really deep relationships, this deep knowing of other people with God, with our spouses, with our friends, with our fellow workers, it's not by avoiding conflict, it's by going through it. Ooh, I don't think I wanna hear that. It's such a powerful tool when you use it well. So in the uh, corporate consulting that I do with Pat Lencioni's group, my partner and I were with a company back in 2008. I don't usually remember years, but this is why I remember that year. It was in the middle of the recession. It was the only company that we were working with was actually making money. They were growing by about 35%. Very fast growth, very young leadership team. The first day of our offsite, my partner Kent and I had taken them through the five dysfunctions of a team. We had done some Myers-Briggs work. The second day, so we had gone through trust and conflict. The second day we were talking about what is your current vision, mission, and strategy in your organization? How do you get clarity on that? And then how do you integrate what does it mean to be a healthy team with executing against that mission, vision, and strategy and values? So one of the things that you find out as a consultant is usually by lunchtime on the first day, they will take my partner and I separately or together and let us, everybody individually will let us know who the problem on the team is. It's never them. 
Nobody ever comes and says, I'm the problem on the team, and you'll find that out soon enough. We knew by lunchtime that Lisa was the problem on the team. And already you know that's a problem because it's always a systems issue. So Lisa was the scapegoat, but Lisa didn't know it. So on the second day, in the middle of talking about strategy, Steve, one of the youngest guys on the team, probably 30 years old, was just kind of moving around in a seat like a volcano that was getting ready to erupt. And all I can guess now is because of what we had talked about the day before about conflict and healthy conflict, he just couldn't hardly sit still. Lisa was talking. And in the middle of her talking, she, he interrupts her and says, Lisa, you're a jerk and you never get your work done on time. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what I meant. And everybody freezes, it's quiet, everybody looks at their shoes, and I, I'm thinking, I don't know what to do next. I hope Kent knows what to do next, because I don't know what to do next. So Kent, who is the most non-anxious person I've ever met in my life, I think his pulse is about six beats a minute, stands up and says, well, that's a very interesting comment to make. And then he says to the team, is it true that Lisa doesn't get her work done on time? Again, everybody looks at their feet. Then this is what he did next. He goes to the flip chart with a red pen, red Sharpie, and writes in the left-hand corner, Lisa, you're a jerk. I'm like, okay, we're not getting paid. They're going to kick us out. <laughs> on the right-hand side, you never get your work done on time. And then he said in a stroke of genius, these are two completely separate issues. The way you said it, Steve, I'm going to guess already you've thought of three different ways you could have said that better. I'm thinking, I want your mother's phone number because I need to call her because she did not raise you like this. But the issue is whether or not Lisa gets her work done on time. So he said, if you wouldn't mind for just a minute to this team of seven or eight people, we're going to start with the issue. I promise you we're going to get back to the way he said it. Especially in Christian circles, we get so caught up in the way something got said and here's the deal, you've got to give people permission to do something poorly in order to do it well. This is where resilience comes in and forgiveness. Um, we're going to get to that, but let's start with the issue. And then he looked at the team and he said, does Lisa get her work done on time? Nobody would answer. So then he said, okay, Heather, here's the deal. I want one word. I want a yes or a no. I don't want a story, a caveat, or an explanation. Just a yes or a no. Went around the circle. Everybody but one person said, no, she doesn't get her work done on time. And the one person that said she did, I think, was her BFF and just wanted to protect her. So then we have this discussion. At this point, somebody in a very, uh, I think, well-intentioned but misguided effort to be kind said to her, Lisa, as of a year ago, you were one of the high performers on the team. Something happened. Is there something going on at home? Which sounds kind, but I'm thinking, you waited a year to ask her that? And she said, no, nothing's going on at home. And then she just was bubbling over. She was caught between furious and embarrassed. She said, first of all, I cannot believe you guys waited until there were two strangers in our circle to bring this up. But of course, that's what they do when outsiders come in. And then she said, um, I can tell you right now what the problem is. I can tell every single one of you has been talking about this behind my back. I can tell the way you're looking at each other. Well, she wasn't wrong. This system was so messed up, it was ready to implode over something as stupid as this. And then she said, here's the problem. We've grown 35% in the last year. I'm the only high-level administrator on the team. Every single one of you is giving me a third more work than you gave me last year. I'm dying. This is not a big problem. The CEO sitting there going, I'm kind of embarrassed because we have enough money. Go hire somebody to help you. I mean, we solved the problem pretty quickly. Then he went back over here. Now, guess how much power had gone out of the poor way that Steve said it by then. 70% of it. And then to his credit, 30-year-old Steve stood up and told Kent to sit down and said, I'll take it from here. And then he looked at Lisa and he said, first of all, I need to apologize. He said, I, I kept that in so long that it came out really poorly. Well, okay, who hasn't done that? Can we not forgive somebody for doing that? We can forgive somebody for doing that. And then he said, let me put it this way. I find myself increasingly frustrated when I come into work every day and everybody else on the team has their work done and you don't. If you can't hear that kind of feedback, you don't belong on a leadership team. Conflict is one of the best tools we have to get deep down to the issues and solve them at the root problem. But the problem is with Christians, we live on terminal niceness and artificial harmony and pseudo community. And then we wonder why nothing ever really changes. Our church, just 18 months ago, the top leadership team went through a fishbowl exercise. Consultant came in, every person on the leadership team 
had eight people that were interviewed by this consultant and gave the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then they had to sit while the other seven were around them and listen to the feedback. Brutal. And good, but mostly brutal. <laughs> mostly brutal, let's be honest. It took a while, which changed us, for them to realize this was not brutal. This was life. And in a Christian context, in the deepest sense of the word, it was life. This was not only change for the organization's chain, sent, uh, good, but this was change at the deepest spiritual level. Because here's the truth, when you and I come to work, we bring our brokenness with us. We bring our insecurities, we bring our fears, we bring stuff we're not even aware is our stuff. And then we try to talk to each other and there's all of this stuff in between us and we don't even know it. And then Christ is trying to get in there somewhere and say, hey, I'm right here in the middle of it. And we don't even see him. And so conflict over time done well. And again, you, you'll do it poorly at first. That's what I'm, apologies are for. Do you know how organizations change and relationships change when people genuinely apologize to each other? When it gets personal and crosses that line, which it will, and you really then begin to understand what does forgiveness mean? What does it mean not to hold a grudge and go and talk about somebody in the other room when they're not in the room? As people, Christians especially, will say, well, I don't want to say that because I don't want to hurt their feelings. What you mean is you don't want to hurt their feelings when they're in the room because when they're not in the room, you don't mind hurting their feelings. Conflict in the work setting is one of the most powerful spiritual formation tools that we have. And to begin to wield it in ways to begin to understand each other and work together better is one of the most profound things I learned as a nurse. And then the last thing I would, talk, I would say, and then I'll give us a little chance to maybe do some conversation together, is what does it mean to be a great team? What does it mean to be a great team? I love teams. I think teams are the best things in the world to lead through. I think we're called to lead in teams. I think that's why everybody has different spiritual gifts. I think that's why within the first three chapters of every gospel that Jesus called the 12. And I mean, he called a zealot and a tax collector. He put people on that team that didn't like each other. They were a bunch of knuckleheads. They kind of messed up a lot. One of my favorite passages is in Acts chapter four or six, where it describes Peter and John as unschooled ordinary men who had been with Jesus. These were not the brightest bulbs on the block. These were men who were not accepted into rabbi school. That's why they were fishermen. These were losers, capital L, and Jesus said, follow me. And they said, okay. And they were transformed enough, not a lot, but they were transformed enough that after three and a half years, Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom over to Peter. I wouldn't have given them to Peter. He was the biggest mess up there was. But Jesus gave them to Peter. If Jesus needed a team around him, I think he was showing us that if my movement's going to go forward, this is how it's going to need to work. Lencioni says that teams are the most underestimated sources of power in an organization. To be a leader, you have to be great at leading teams. Getting the right people in the right positions, moving the wrong people off or in different positions, doing whatever it takes for the sake of the organization to flourish. You have to have great emotional intelligence. You have to know other people really well. You have to be a collaborative leader that's not afraid to have other people's ideas and the belief that all of our ideas together are probably going to be exponentially better than any one of us individually. To lead on a team, you have to be able to manage tensions, not just solve problems. Because tensions are things that keep coming up and keep coming up. They're never going to go away. Frustration level needs to go down because this is a tension. It's not a problem to solve. You're going to have to always be working with it. But Jesus was saying that if I orchestrate the efforts between these 12 and eventually these 11, what I believe will be true after only three, three and a half years is that when I leave, a movement will start. It will be absolutely unstoppable. Most of us have been on great teams before. It's one of the most memorable times of my life on this emergency room team and then another team that I led was that when I was on staff at Willow Creek Community Church where we did great ministry things because the collective was more than the individual. I believe to my toes that leadership is that important and that Christians 
ought to be the leaders in our world that are taking other people's breaths away by the way that we lead, the way that we treat people, the decisions that we make for our organizations and for our people so that we have cultural renewal and change happens. And that's all I have to say. So we have a few more minutes, questions, comments, thoughts, recipes, whatever. Yeah. So Jamie, stand up. Uh, if you ever look at my book, Leadership Rubber Bands, that's the man I dedicated it to. Uh, and of course, he would sit right back down. Jamie used to be a chemist at City of Hope and one day felt God's call to go to Talbot, became a youth pastor at Whittier Area Baptist Fellowship. I was 19 years old going to Biola. We had Christian service assignments. I was 19 years old when I decided, well, I'm old enough to work with the high school department at my church. Oh my gosh. I mean, what I write about Jamie is, he's the first person that ever told me I was a leader. He was the first person that ever told me I was a teacher. He shepherded me like a father. He came alongside of me when I did something well and told me how great I did and then told me to get over myself. And then when I screwed up, it took me a while to realize what he was meaning, but he would say, if you could do that over again, what would you do differently? I'm like, he said that about three times now. I think I messed up. <laughs> He was the first person. And there have been a series of people since then that have built into me for different seasons of my life. Um, Bill Hybels was one, Max Dupree was one, um, different bosses, this ER doc, um, that have just kind of challenged me and loved me. It's like that combination of a relationship and a challenge is just a great crucible for leadership. All right, let me close us in prayer and then we'll get you out early so you can get home on this terrible night of horrible rain. <laughs> let me pray for us. Can I do that? I've got a couple things I'm going to say. Well, then you pray for us. No, you pray. But I'm, thinking, I'm thinking they're just a little bashful. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm thinking there's there. questions. Well, but there doesn't have Guys. to be. There doesn't have to be. Well, there but has to be. There has to be. No, there doesn't. We can, we can disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. Good. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and the boss is saying that she had a thing that she rolled out the HR manual, the HR manual. Mm -hmm. I'm the HR manager. What are the, the challenges that I see in getting the message out to employees? And then how do you counsel your management team to work on how to achieve what leadership is part of it, your passion for the nonprofit, just not just be verbal? Mm -hmm. which will invoke cynicism very quickly. Um, for a couple of things, there needs to be a collaborative process. So whether it's focus groups, there's got to be dozens of them, of cross-functional people in the organization in groups of five to eight that she and you maybe are meeting with um, for a shortened period of time, about three weeks. I don't know how big is the organization. Yeah, maybe, maybe two weeks really intense, back-to-back, -back, quick, and then you have to over-communicate. And that's from Lencioni's stuff, you over-communicate. People, you know, we all know that people need to hear things seven times. Until people in your organization can mock the leader, you have not got the vision through. They have to know it. Um, so she, you've got to over-communicate, and you primarily, you primarily build a, culture, a new culture by the stories you tell and the heroes you create. So she's got to tell stories in multiple venues of people in the organization that are getting the strategy, getting on board with it, and then the whys behind it. Um, in churches, we create heroes out of the wrong people. We make our preachers heroes, and that's fine, but they get paid to do that. You know, we have a couple in our church that are 60 and have just gone through their 111th foster kid. Okay, we got a hero. We gotta make heroes and tell stories about the people that are living out the values and getting the strategy, and you have to get people together to collaborate on it, because people won't buy in unless they've had a chance to speak into something. Yeah, but I would do it in a short period of time. Yeah, sure, yeah. 
Oh, man, that's a good question. Uh, it's probably sooner than you think. And you, I would ask people. I would ask a couple of people that are really close to me, that know me well, help me figure out when it's time for me to leave. And I'm going to keep coming back to you every couple months and asking you. Um, I think the more you put things out on the table and don't keep them secret, the better it is. I don't think I've ever seen too many people leave too early, but I have sure seen people stay too long. Um, I wish I could say there's always that sense where you just know, but th there's not. The other thing I would say is the worst, the, the worst thing that can happen is you make a mistake, Jesus forgives you, and he's got something else wonderful for you to do. So I think when you, you know, you're, you're building up that next generation of leaders, when you see them start to want to, ready to and want to take over pieces, and you've mentored them in those roles, you keep stepping back a little bit more and a little bit more. It's like that scene out of Seabiscuit at the very end, where if you remember, um, Red Pollard, the jockey, goes through a terrible accident. He's in the hospital. He can't ride. He gets another jockey to ride Seabiscuit, but only if the other jockey will come into the hospital and he will coach him because he knows Seabiscuit. Here's what this animal does. Here's how you need to treat him. Here's how you pull the bit and bridle. Here's what you need to do with his eyes. You remember, you have to get him next to another horse that will see the fire in the other horse's eye, and then he'll take off. So this other jockey rides Seabiscuit successfully, and then Red Pollard heals up, and at Santa Anita Racetrack, he's back on Seabiscuit, and he's surprised, he is surprised to see the other jockey on another horse, and they chat for a minute. They go to the starting gate. Gate goes up, and the cinematography is amazing because you can hear the creaks and the bones and Red Pollard's healing bones that have not knitted together yet. Seabiscuit is falling behind, and that other jockey purposely pulls his horse back so that Seabiscuit can see his horse eye to eye and then says to Red Pollard, see you at the finish line, and Seabiscuit takes off and wins the race. And I'm sitting there watching that movie crying, Tink. that's a church. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what a healthy organization is. So the leaders are developing those other leaders. They're stepping back a little by little, and then they're sending them forward and ahead. That's not a very good answer, but that's all I got. That's all I got. Yeah, back there. Um, you mentioned already that Christians are usually the leaders that take Yeah. Yeah. Very people-centered. Um, innovative, collaborative, give great feedback, hard feedback, um, but still keep the relationship connected, challenge people, great decision maker, and not afraid to admit mistakes when they fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here and then here. Not quite sure how to word this, but you know, first of all, thank you so much. This was just a wonderful life. Good. So Good. Good. You're welcome. But when you work for an organization that's, um, you know, everybody is so kind to each other and doesn't want to hurt each other and you don't have that conflict, what's a good way? Mm -hmm. to it's a great question. Um, start by making observations and asking questions. So I don't know what a good example would be in your situation, but um, uh, Scott McKnight, who's at North Park Seminary in Chicago, says people only change in two situations. So this is, you need to know this as a leader, you need to know this as somebody who spiritually forms people. People change when they're on a quest or they're in a crisis. So you can't make people be on a quest, they're just either wired that way or they're not. You can't create a crisis in somebody's life, but you can create a rhetorical crisis by the words that you use. So by observations and questions, you create a rhetorical crisis in their brain, like Jesus did, that makes them walk away from the conversation, huh? You know, you seemed a little impatient in the meeting today when you answered um, Sue's question, is, is there anything going on? And of course, if it's a culture where they're not used to that, they're going to say, oh, no, 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 everything's fine. That's great. So maybe later on in the day, you go back and you say, you know, I just want to follow up because I, I just don't think everything was okay. And you kind of make it okay for them to say everything's okay. So I'd make observations and questions. Um, maybe if there's an appropriate time in a meeting to say, you know, one of the things I just heard about or I've been reading about, Pat's book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, a uh, book called Crucial Conversations, fabulous books on conflict. I've been reading about how much conflict can help an organization, and I don't know about you guys, but I don't think we do that at all. 
what do the rest of you think? Could we, can I read it? Next time we get together, can I read a couple paragraphs out of this chapter? So you just start to plan. You know, change never happens as fast as we want it, but then once it gets to tipping point, it, fa- it moves faster than we can keep up with it. So you have to plant little seeds of discontent and questions to get people to move towards tipping point. Yeah, uh, back there. Any team is not ready for conflict? Um, it's, that's a great question. So in Pat's model, in Pat Lancioni's model of the five dysfunctions of a team, the foundation of it is trust. So you gotta have trust in order to have conflict. Well, a lot of people say, well, it takes five years to build trust. No, it doesn't take five years to build trust. Trust is basically about character and competency. So you hire people for character and competency, so you ought to have a team that already has a fair amount of trust with each other. And then the place where Patrick pushes the envelope on trust is vulnerability. Great leaders are vulnerable leaders. People trust vulnerable leaders. If you have not watched Brene Brown's TED talk on vulnerability, shame on you. Now she would hate that I said that because shame's bad. Vulnerability, no, it's fabulous. But what vulnerability does, then, then you're ready to have conflict. But it's not as simple as, it's not a linear thing because you have to take a risk to have conflict, not knowing if you have enough trust. Trust is something you're always building or repairing. It's not a static quality in an organization. And another supplemental book to trust is Stephen Covey's book, The Speed of Trust. Phenomenal case for saying when we have high trust in an organization, we make faster decisions, higher quality decisions, and it affects our bottom line. So you, gotta t- you can't have conflict without somebody taking a risk. The leader's gotta be the first person to do it, to be vulnerable. And you can start it off with a question or a comment instead of a statement. Once a team gets more comfortable with each other, the conflict can go up. If you're a fly on the wall, you might be a little embarrassed to be there, but they can recover quickly. That's a healthy team. Yeah, so you gotta take a little risk. Yeah, and then you can apologize and say, you know, I don't think I said that well. It's, it's hard work. This is, why, this is one of the reasons we avoid it. It's just hard work, yeah. A couple of years ago, um, John and I are just, you know, like any married couple, very, very different. And um, I said to him, okay, we've been married at this point 28 years. Here's the deal. I hold back all the time. (laughs) His eyes got big, like, you hold back. I hold back all the time. And I'm going to stop holding back. And he's just like, oh, (laughs) Please don't. So we all have, like our family of origin, we all have very different thresholds for conflict. And part of being mature is raising that threshold. And some of you that are too easy to do it, it's ratcheting it down a notch or two. Leading up is so hard, so hard. Um, read Tim Keller's book, Every Good Endeavor. Oh, phenomenal. Read Andy Crouch's book about power, his most recent one. Those will just really inform you. And then ask questions and make observations. And then tie it to the, the vision and the why. That's, a, that's what cultural renewal is about. It's about the vision of who we can be, who the world can be, what problems we can solve, and why. And ask them questions about... Um, Why did we make that decision? How does that tie to what we say on paper is our vision? What more could we do in our industry um, if we, because somewhere along the line, we all lose our idealism. And that's not all bad. We all have to kind of grow up and live in reality. But to recapture the good parts of our idealism, have we lost some of that? Um, To kind of catch the fire going again. Yeah. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.